seems like there is a dummy's guide for just about anything nowadays. Recently, Mary and I purchased a camera and in our learning how to use it, uh, we, I, we came across a dummy's guide to the Canon 90D. And so we've, I've been reading through some of that to try and learn how to use the camera. And you can get all sorts of versions of these books. Here are some different titles that I came across this week. Decision Intelligence for Dummies. Wait for it. This book will teach you how to incorporate formulas from established sciences into a framework in a specific order to tether all subsequent actions to an intended result. Well, if you didn't feel like a dummy before you read the book, you'd probably feel like one after. Or this one, getting into medical school for dummies. Now, I don't know about you, but if I saw this book on my doctor's shelf, I would think about getting a different doctor. And then the classic, artificial intelligence for dummies. Now think about that for a little bit. I don't know about you, but I think that title says it all. And while there's a range of guides for romantic relationships and dating, they don't have a guide for dealing with people everyday relationships in life. But don't fear, because today we will delve into the original Dummies Guide for Wise Relationships. Let me pray. Jesus, we thank you for humour, for laughter, for, for the ability that we can just join together in the way that you created us to be. But Jesus, we also recognise that in the creation of the world, you created us for relationships. It is not good for man to be alone. And so you created us in the image of you, a triune God, and you created us for relationship. Help us as we delve into the wisdom of the ages, as we try and discern and glean some more today on how we can live life well as we follow you. Amen. One of the things that I inherited from my mum is an interest in observing how people interact with each other and human behaviour. Social cues and engagement with others are fascinating. And if you want to accelerate your learning um, on interacting with others and what to and what not to do, then delve with me for just a few moments into the wisdom of the ages as we discover the wisdom that Proverbs can give us and what it teaches us about people and human behaviour, from what to steer clear of and what is frustrating and the basics of good behaviour. Proverbs, like hundreds and thousands sprinkled across a good cake, adding colour and crunch, the collection of Proverbs sprinkled through the Bible um, is just a wonderful resource and a blessing. And while we find them through the whole Bible, the collection of Proverbs nestled between Psalm and Ecclesiastes finds its greatest concentration. So if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24 starts with a warning to steer clear of evil and rebellious people. It says, don't envy evil people or desire their company, for their hearts plot violence and their words always stir up trouble. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have thought that steering away from evil people would have been a no-brainer. Steer clear of evil people. But not all people, evil people, elicit feelings of disgust or revulsion, do they? If they did, then we'd have no need for this warning. The key to this warning are in the verbs that the writer of Proverbs uses. Envy and desire. Now, there is a temptation in the novelty factor 
of uh, what evil people sometimes display. Evil people often will display things of power and wealth. Now, that's not to say that all evil people have power and wealth, and neither are all people who are powerful, all the people who are powerful and wealthy, they need not be evil either. But it gives us an understanding of what to be wary of, because there is a danger that when we find wealth and power attractive and impressive, then they become bait, as it were, on a hook of evil people and that they know how to use it. People who long for wealth and power can be sucked into the web of evil. And as a result, they find themselves trapped. They can experience trouble and violence. It can be physical and emotional violence, relational violence, or even if it's not all out violence, it can be the loss of independence through coercion and control. In the 2016 article, The Role of Social Novelty in Risk-Seeking and Exploratory Behaviour, the authors highlight that there is this, this um, influence that novel social contexts evoke where it enhances risk-taking behaviours in people. And my guess is that you've probably experienced it, you've seen it, or you've feared it as a parent. A teacher or a young adult goes to a party and they see a perceived popular person who exhibits power and influence over others. The popular person with evil intent the part, um, in the part, goes to the party goer and encourages them to try something new that they ought not to be doing. With the believed result of a great experience and increased social standing. That's why the writer of Proverbs says, don't envy evil people or desire their company, for their hearts plot violence and their words will always stir up trouble. But we also need to be careful not to gloat about it when evil people get their, what we might see as their just desserts, get theirs. In Proverbs 24, 17 to 18, it says, Don't rejoice when your enemies fall. Don't be happy when they stumble. For the Lord will be displeased with you and will turn his anger away from them. In a world that we have around us that is distorted by reality de- reality TV shows like Survivor, Big Brother and The Bachelor. We see people celebrate when their enemies, those that are standing in the way of them getting what they want, when their enemies fall. We can believe that celebrating the failures of um, those who stand against us is, is the way that we should behave because that's what we see at times modelled on TV. But gloating over the failures of others speaks more about our character than about our enemies. People sometimes mistakenly think that God's punishment of uh, the wicked brings him joy, when really it doesn't. God disciplines people, is, and when he gets, disciplines people, it's out of a desire to see change of behaviour, not some twisted satisfaction that God has to see people suffer. And so, when those who would do others harm, when they stumble and fall, we should not take delight. What God desires is for our enemies and for us to be our very best. For those that are made in the Creator's image to also have the character of the Creator. And so when we delight in the misfortunes of others, we actually distance ourselves from God who created us in his image. And that's not what God wants. So we do well steering clear of evil people and not delighting in their discipline. Next, in our dummy's guide to wise relationships is the frustration 
of fools. A fool is someone who is silly or stupid, who lacks judgment or common sense. Proverbs 26, 6 to 12 gives us a rapid fire account of interacting with foolish people. It says this, Proverbs 26, 6 to 11. Trusting a fool to convey a message is like cutting off one's feet or drinking poison. A proverb in the mouth of a fool is as useless as a paralyzed leg. Honouring a fool is as foolish as tying a stone to a slingshot. A proverb in the mouth of a fool is like a thorny branch brandished by a drunk. An employer who hires a fool or a bystander is like an archer who shoots at random and probably one that you might know well. As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his foolishness. This is not a summary of a person who has an intellectual disability. Instead, the writer is focused on someone who ought to know better, but chooses not to behave better. Someone who is repeatedly unreliable, who fails to access what they know and uh, understand as good judgment, good decisions, and they instead engage in negative consequences for them and for those around them. They waste people's time. They waste people's resources. They fail to learn from their mistakes and they are determined to repeat them like a dog that is looking to devour its vomit. The the writer of Proverbs sees engaging with the fool as a no-win situation. You can sense the frustration in this next verse in Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Don't answer the foolish arguments of fools or you'll become as foolish as they are. But then he goes on to say, be sure to answer the foolish arguments of fools or they will become wise in their own estimation. It's as if the writer of Proverbs is saying, trying to answer a fool, well, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. It's a lose-lose situation. Trying to refute a foolish argument is a fool's errand. But if you don't refute their argument, then they will think that they are right and they'll go away believing so. The writer paints a bleak picture of fools. But just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, the writer goes on and as it it were to do a thousand BC mic drop at the end of it all, says in Proverbs 26, 12, there is more hope for fools than for people who think they are wise. Drops mic, walks off stage. The ultimate folly in a book from a collection of wisdom is to think that you don't need it, that you think that you've arrived, that you're already wise. Then, in our Dummy's Guide to Wise Relationships, the writer also draws together a collection of wisdom directed at self, how to behave, the do's and don'ts of how to live life well, and to be respected by others. Briefly, a few don'ts, two do's, and where to look for wisdom. In living life well, one of the most important things is to be a person who can be trusted. Gossip is such destructive behaviour. It has been a point of concern as we explore a potential redevelopment. If we find that as a church family, we leak out information that we ought not to be leaking out because it's it's confidential information and it's not to be shared outside of the church meeting, then we can undermine, we can lose our relationship and our relationship standing with any possible redevelopment. And as bad as that is, even worse is when people gossip about others. 
That's why it's particular focus in Proverbs about the, the destructive nature of gossiping. In Proverbs 25, 9 to 10, we read this. When arguing with your neighbour, don't betray another person's secret. Others may accuse you of gossip and you will never regain your good reputation. Proverbs 26, 20. Fire goes out without wood and quarrels disappear when gossip stops. And a couple of verses later in verse 22. Rumours. Rumours are dainty morsels that sink deep into one's heart. The best measure I've found for determining whether uh, someone is gossiping or not is if you are saying something about someone else and you would not like to be quoted in saying that, then you're in dangerous territory. If I use John as an example. If I'm talking about John to someone else and they said, oh, do you mind if I quote you on that, of what you're saying about John to so-and-so? And And if I thought, no, 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 don't quote me on that, then that's dangerous territory that I'm in. Another form, an exception to this, and there are some exceptions, but an exception to this is if you're asking someone that of what for wise counsel in how to deal with and respond to a situation. There is a saying that those who gossip to you are just as likely to gossip about you. Another form of gossip is making stuff up when you don't know what the truth is. Rumours are like dainty morsels They become like a sinister form of power. You believe you have inside information, control of that information. And you don't believe and don't believe that just because there is smoke, there is fire. Because we realise that just because we see smoke, there's not necessarily a fire going on there. We might just be interpreting or understanding that situation incorrectly. As someone who has been the subject of rumour and gossip in a previous church, Mary and I can testify, as I'm sure many of you, if you've ever experienced gossip or rumour, can testify to how much hurt and pain comes from gossip and rumour. Another don't is to don't over-promise and under-deliver. Have you ever experienced the frustration of someone who promises you one thing and then what you get is so much less? If you've ever eaten takeaway food, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Dining out, getting takeaway, you see the menu and you imagine what it's going to be like. And on the board, what you see or on the menu, what it shows or what it describes And then what you get served is so very different. The writer of Proverbs puts it like this in Proverbs 25, 14. A person who promises a gift but doesn't give it is like clouds and wind that bring no rain. Tradesmen, contractors, service providers, politicians all do well to under-promise and over deliver. But rather than waiting on others to live a life like this, how about we live a life like this? When we say we will do something, or to be somewhere, or to uh, arrange for something, then let's live that out. Otherwise, we can be like the clouds in a dry and dusty land that promise so much, but deliver no rain. That's why the writer in verse, the verse uh, before speaks about how refreshing it is when people are trustworthy. In Proverbs 25, 13, trustworthy messengers refresh like snow in summer. They revive the spirit of their employer. Don't overpromise and underdeliver. 
But even more black and white is don't tell lies. Lies in any situation can destroy others. Like gossip, lies can destroy a good reputation. Proverbs 26, 18 to 19 puts it like this. Just as damaging as a madman shooting a deadly weapon is someone who lies to a friend and then says, oh, that's all right, I was only joking. But rather than telling lies, be honest. In uh, chapter 24, verse 26, an honest answer is like a kiss of friendship. Or a little bit later in chapter 27, verse 6, the writer of Proverbs writes this, wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. But even when we're telling the truth, when we're having an honest conversation with someone, we need to be sensitive about how we do that. We can't just bowl in there and just like be a bull at a gate and just go, go for broke with it. We need to be sensitive. And Proverbs gives us some clues about that. It reminds us to be sensitive in how we engage with others. In Proverbs 25 verse 20, singing cheerful songs to a person with a heavy heart is like taking someone's coat in cold weather or pouring vinegar on a wound. A little bit later in chapter 27, 14, a loud and cheerful greeting early in the morning will be taken as a curse. For Mary and I, we had a friend that used to love getting up at the crack of dawn. And they thought it was okay for them to give us a call when they were up and awake and all that sort of stuff, which doesn't go well when you're a night owl. Don't lie. Do tell the truth. But also be sensitive about how you do it the timing of when you do it, what's going on for the other person. Are they going through a really tough time? Then, you know, just don't go up and say, oh, buck up, little one. It's all right. You know, you've got to be sensitive about how you do those things. Think about your relationship with other, the other person. Do you have their best interests at heart? Or is it more about just wanting to be right? Is now the right time? for you to have a chat when you think about what's going on in their life. Just because you have a thought bubble doesn't mean you've got to say it. Okay, you need to think about when you might say it in the appropriate time. And last, do seek wide, wise guidance, a mentor. Chapter 24, verse 5 and 6. The wise are mightier than the strong, and those with knowledge grow stronger and stronger. So don't go to war without wise guidance. Victory depends on having many advisors. Advisors or mentors can come in all short sorts of shapes and sizes, can't they? From literature, books and authors can, can be a timeless sharing of wisdom for us. But also in the relationships that um, we can intentionally establish with others. While some people experience mentoring through osmosis by sitting in on a, um, a situation or listening to a presenter speak, um, being in the presence of someone and just soaking up the, their knowledge that they give can be great. But there's also benefit in having an established mentoring or wise guide relationship. Sam last week mentioned about how she lent into those relationships in making important decisions. And of course, their relationships that were already established. It wasn't just a case of just ringing up someone randomly and asking for their advice. She learned how she could lean into them and allow these speak people to speak into her life. For the last 30-ish years, I've had a variety of people that I've intentionally engaged in my life to help speak into my life and to help me to live life well, to hold me accountable and ask the tough questions of my life. And I hope and desire to be a better person because of their influence in my life as well. It's better to be smarter than stronger and wise guidance can help save us from a world of hurt 
and accelerate our ability to be the best that we can. So while it does not have it in the title of Proverbs, a dummy's guide to life, there is a lot of wisdom that we can gain from the pages of this collection to help us in our interactions with other people, to help us have wise relationships. Let me pray. Jesus, we thank you for the wisdom within the pages of your word, the word that you inspired and still inspires and speaks into our life today. We thank you for the truths that it contains, the challenges and the opportunity that it has us to sit back and and take notice of some of the stuff that is written in there, stuff that we can easily wash over in the busyness of life. Help us to take time to sit, to soak, to allow you, Holy Spirit, to speak to our spirit, to encourage us to be the best that we can be, to live life well. We ask that you would continue to do your work in us and through us. Amen. So how might we respond today? One of the things that we encourage is after the message is just to take some time to pause and to reflect and to respond to the things that God might have been saying to you today. Well, do your relationships help you to be a better person? Do they help you in your faith? Or do they take away from you and your relationship with Jesus, your relationship and your desire to be your best? What are you like in holding a confidence? Or do you struggle with gossip? Ask God to help you to be wise in what you say and to whom you say it. Do you overpromise and underdeliver? Or are you a person of your word? And lastly, pray that you can be that trusted friend who is honest, who loves those around you and seeks the best for them. There's going to be some opportunity for us to respond to the things that God's saying to us today, to listen to some music, and then uh, I encourage you to use those response cards to jot down what God's saying to you today. Thanks.